Uh, Dr. Seeley is a graduate of Thomas Aquinas College in um, California, where he currently resides, and he also serves as a tutor there. Um, he uh, loves his love for has been for teaching and learning um, about uh, from the greatest minds of the Western civilization. And 19, he's a 1987 grad of Thomas Aquinas. He received a, his licentiate from the Pontifical Institute in Medieval Studies in Toronto, and he has a PhD in me, Medieval Studies from the University of Toronto. Um, he has uh, uh, really thought a lot about education, specifically classical education, but, but more importantly, Catholic education. And it's almost the mouthful of Catholic classical education as I told our superintendent um, when he, he toured the school here a couple of months ago, it's really just Catholic education because it's a reclamation of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And I think Dr. Seeley would touch on, on that and other topics. So let's give him a warm Sacred Heart welcome to Dr. Seeley. Thank you for welcoming me, and I'm very, I'm very glad to be here. I'm grateful to Sacred Heart Academy and the Catechetical Foundation's um, organization for bringing me up here. Um, I am actually a native Michigander. I was born in Kalamazoo and um, had family in the, the Kalamazoo area and in Grand Rapids for a long time. And another sign of the providential character being here was that my uh, aunt, who was a long time resident and teacher in Grand Rapids passed away a week ago and we were able to have her memorial service this morning so it was it worked out very well I'm I love the opportunities I've had to travel around the country and even a little internationally that means Canada to um, <laughs> to visit with all of the wonderful schools that have either popped into existence in the last 15 or 20 years, or like Sacred Heart, have taken on a renewed commitment to Catholic education by embracing a classical model. Um, it really has become a movement. Uh, our third conference in Cleveland this summer is, uh, I expect, 150 people from about 50 different institutions, and I'm pretty sure we'll have to shut the doors about a month early for registration. Um, so it's really grown. One of the, one of the places, reasons it took off, I think, uh, there are many. One of them was, though, that uh, St. Jerome's School in Academy in uh, Hyattsville, Maryland, was the first parochial school that seriously decided to address its enrollment problems by offering Catholic parents what they wanted, which was a serious Catholic education. And they went from... Um, from being on the verge of going out of existence to uh, having to turn away people now in the course of five years. But they also, they not only did that themselves, but they became a model um, in many ways for other schools, so they paved the way for other schools to be able to have a guide in how to do this. And um, Sacred Heart Academy, I think, is providing that same kind of leadership already even in only their second year of, of, um, of uh, having a classical education. So it's wonderful to be here and to meet so many people and to see the great things that are being done. It always gives me renewed hope for the future of the church in our country. So my talk today is a wise and understanding people, the complete task of Catholic education. Um, they asked me for a title a long time ago before I had the talk. so. Um, I had to kind of work the talk into the title because I picked the wise and understanding people and then I started looking back at the source of that which is Deuteronomy and then I looked at, I looked a lot at Deuteronomy and that fits so well with all of the things I see being done at schools like Sacred Heart that it was really providential though I had to, I changed the orientation a little bit from what I'd given them before. So when Moses stood on the brink of the Holy Land having led Israel in the desert for 40 years. He gathered the people together to prepare them for their future. 
He urged them to obey the statutes and the ordinances they had received. He promised them a reward if they did. Surprisingly, his first promise to them was not that they would, in the words of the immortal Spock, live long and prosper. Here's what he said. Behold, I have taught you statutes and ordinances as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land which you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And when I first read this passage as a freshman in college, which is a terrible thing that I first read this important part of the Bible when I was a student in college, I was very skeptical. Growing up as a Catholic in the 70s, I could hardly think of anyone, friend, teacher, parent, media star, newspaper writer, who thought of Christians or of the Jews as wise and understanding people. Quite the opposite. The way serious Christians were portrayed at, was as backward, ignorant, and bigoted. Archie Bunker referred to the Bible more than anyone I could think of. That probably doesn't mean anything to some of you here, but <laughs> um, to others it does. The cultural attitude had a big effect on my faith. I found it very hard to take my faith seriously and certainly impossible to defend. My father fig vigorously defended the teachings of the church but I am ashamed to say he seemed crazy to me and to everyone else that I knew. Uh, the religious zealot. Over the past three decades of teaching, I have discovered the many, many ways in which we Catholics have really have received wisdom and understanding. But why don't more of us seem to have confidence that we are a wise and understanding people? Many have pointed out that there's been a general failure in catechesis since the council but many can also witness that even good catechesis fails to persuade our, our young. Why? I think Deuteronomy provides some clues. Reading through Deuteronomy, we discover that Moses didn't simply tell the Israelites to obey the statutes. But he didn't offer them theological arguments either. Instead, he urged them over and over to remember what had happened to them. Only take heed and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. The command to remember what the Lord had done, is, done for them is given 14 times in Deuteronomy. He insisted that the statutes and ordinances must be passed along with the stories which gave them context and meaning. He vividly recalled for them in passage after passage the great manifestations of the Lord, the providence and the power that he exercised on their behalf. This fits with the very character of the law itself. When our Lord referred to the law, he meant the Pentateuch, the first five books of our Bible, culminating in Deuteronomy. And if you look through the Pentateuch, sometimes finding the statutes and ordinances isn't real easy. They are there, but they're buried in many, many powerful and wild and weird and inspiring stories. It's always an eye-opener, right? To go from Catholic catechesis to actually read the, uh, the Old Testament, the Pentateuch especially. Almost all of Genesis and most of Exodus consist simply of stories. Numbers follows the Israelites in their desert wanderings. Even Leviticus intersperses memorable stories among its regulations for priests. In Deuteronomy, which takes place after the 40 years of wandering, Moses guides the people in reflecting on what, they have, on what they've experienced and what they can remember so that they can see the connection between the commands which are to guide their future life and the experience of the Lord who gave them. He turns their memories into stories 
highlighting the vivid images that open to them the ways of the Lord. The first thing Moses bids them remember is their experience at Mount Horeb when the Lord gave them the Ten Commandments. He said to them, And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And if you, uh, when you read the giving of the commandments in Exodus, you should read it aloud because there's so many details that are really striking. But the, the fire and the smoke and the thunder and the trumpets that they heard, uh, it just, it was overwhelm, an overwhelming experience. I get very dramatic when I do this with students and scare them. Um, but it's kind of what happened to the Israelites. They were like, oh, wow, that's God. We're scared. We're scared, we're impressed. You know, both things. They saw and heard things that imaged for them the Lord's power and his light and his darkness. He had no form. He was not like any creature at all. This was the Lord who had forced, them, forced Pharaoh to release them from Egypt. This was the Lord who, sh who uh, had shown his, sorry, who through his devoted care had shown them their own dignity as his people. Several times Moses reminds them of his greatest pain, Moses' own greatest personal pain, which is that he will not be able to enter the promised land. And the reason for that is that when they grumbled and complained and swore at him because he had led them out into the desert and they had nothing and they needed water, Moses finally got fed up and he cursed the Israelites. He called them a rebel people as he smashed the rock and brought forth water for them. But because he had cursed God's holy people, the Lord had forbidden him to go into the promised land. Moses reminded him of that, reminded them of that several times. I don't think it was because he was bitter. I think he really was one trying to teach them a lesson, you know, the, the lesson of it. But the Lord, he showed them, is both intimately close to you and completely beyond your understanding. The stories are essential for living according to the law. Statutes and ordinances alone can be dead and senseless. They only make sense in the context of the life they are meant to guide. They need to be lived in the spirit of a people made holy by a Lord God who is powerful, loving, and transcendent. The stories also show them through Abraham and Jacob and, Mo and Joseph and Moses himself, the beauty and the glory and the mystery and the trial and failure and triumph that surround those who live the Lord's life. Uh, one of my favorite stories among many from the Pentateuch is from Exodus when Moses begs the Lord, show me thy glory. The Lord responds, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand upon the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. What a weird story. <laughs> weird and wonderful, full of meaning and mystery. These are the kind of stories that the fathers of the church meditated on over and over and over again and brought into whatever theological tract they were developing, whatever question or problem they were developing, these kinds of stories would be brought in and then they would offer these incredibly rich interpretations of all the details of the stories. For the stories to be effective, they must be internalized by being heard and remembered and recalled. Memory is a much more powerful faculty than we tend to realize. 
We think of memory as a place in our minds where useful information is stored until we want to turn our attention to it. Uh, the young, unfortunately, are more and more trained to think of memory as a place to stuff what they need to pass the test, which can then be emptied so that they can get through the next one. That's why I call our, our uh, institute newsletter Beyond the Test. That's what um, a lot of, a lot of um, Catholic administrators have told me they really want to have happen for their students and their teachers is they just look beyond the test. Our ancestors considered memory one of the most profound aspects of human psychology. When St. Augustine in his Confessions searches for God, he spends chapters reflecting on the amazing character of memory where he hopes the Lord is to be found. His work on the Holy Trinity inspired the medievals to see the, Holy, the Trinity's image in memory, understanding, and will. Memory, this was the striking one to me, understanding and will I got, but memory they considered as imaging the Father for they realize that memory is the very source of understanding. It's not passive. Memory is essentially active, churning to burst out and force itself on our attention. According to Aristotle, our most basic awareness of the world around us happens when what is in memory connects with something that's present to us. So a crucial thing for, uh, fundamental for human ex for the human experience, is experience, is when you're able to connect what you are experiencing, what you see now, what you perceive, with other things that help you see patterns and help you see that this is not just a chaotic, senseless world that, that has random things happen to you, but there are patterns that you can, you can see, you can come to understand what's going on around you, you can start to anticipate what might happen in the future. Memory is the source of imagination which allows us, which allows us to interpret the world we sense. Memory can also prevent us from making sense of what is in front of us. For the context in which we experience what is past colors our feelings and perceptions about the present and our hopes and anxieties for the future. A student, once, a student once said to me, you tutors must go home and beat your wives and kids. She was fairly serious because her experience of family life made it impossible for her to believe or even imagine that people could be nice all the time. <laughs> this is why St. Augustine prescribes learning the scriptures by heart as the first task for those who wish to discover the riches of scripture. Um, by that, I don't think he meant to take a verse a day and commit it to memory that way, though maybe that works. The way in which the ancients and medievals would tend to memorize things was just by reading them over and over again. So they would, um, you know, whatever work they yeah, we were talking a little bit about this at lunch, but um, they never read silently. They thought it was really weird when people stopped moving their lips. When they, were they always thought of reading as oral, as, as something you hear. The words are to, are to be heard, even if you're just speaking them to yourself. And so they would take a book of the Bible, and they would, they would just read it out loud to themselves. And they would do that a lot. And it's amazing how much your memory will retain when you just read things that way. It's both, it's not the slavish thing of, of memorizing line by line like that, but continuous stories all the time. You hear the words over and over again. That happens to kids all the time still. Um, now it happens with movies and popular music, but it used to happen with Bible stories. <laughs> um, so Augustine said that that's the first thing. If you really want to interpret scripture well, you have to learn it by heart. And the reason is that you need to get the whole into your memory, which forms your imagination, which helps you to 
perceive things that you're reading and thinking about, even though the context might not be something you would leap to right away. So he teaches you when you're interpreting scripture to pay close attention to passages, no matter how different the place they might be in the Bible, but if they use the same word or the same kind of phrasing, then your memory makes a connection and then you start to think about the two of them together and to compare them. And um, St. Augustine would probably tell you that that's the way the scripture authors wrote intentionally. They, all, they wrote that way so that the learning process would be one where connections are made and then you start to wonder about how they're supposed to be compared. And then through that you come to see the real riches in both of the passages even though you wouldn't think of them together. Um, there's a, I think it's in the Song of Songs where the, one of the passages is something like, my, dove is, or my love is like a dove in the cleft of the rock or something like that. And then you've got the Moses passage where Moses was in the cleft in the rock with God. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got a whole different vision of what's going on in the Song of Songs. Um, okay. And not only by learning these things by heart, by learning the scripture by heart, not only does it help you to interpret scripture well, but it also, uh, this kind of thing helps you make sense of your own life and of things that happen around you. The, the spontaneous connections um, give you context in which to see things that, uh, uh, very, even very dramatic situations that happen with you uh, and other people. Um, things in the scriptures will come out and connect and then all of a sudden you're thinking about them in terms of the parable of the prodigal son or, um, or maybe Paul's conversion story or something like that. So then the scriptures become an active part of your understanding of your own life. Moses predicted that the Israelites would not remember the Lord and his covenant. And he warned them of the dire consequences for themselves as a people. Yet he promised that even the sufferings that they brought upon themselves through their lack of remembering would be a reminder, an opportunity for them to come to themselves as the prodigal son did and to remember their father, remember who they were and imagine a new direction for their lives and for themselves as a people. That is in fact what happened and why the Old Testament contains much more than just the, book, the five books of the law. Remembering, interpreting, imagining led to the great variety of the great works found in the rest of the Old Testament. The histories, the songs, the dialogues, allegories and the books of wisdom. They're all, you, you really need to be aware more or less that everything after the Pentateuch, you think, is written, was written with the events of the Pentateuch in mind. So even though it may seem not connected, there's, a, there, there's continual reflection on that, on the, on the experience the Israelites had had through, um, in the time of their kingdom, the experience they had in the exile. All of this affected the later books of, of the Old Testament. Now, I think that it's true that as a whole, we have failed as Catholic educators to catechize our young well. We have failed even more completely, I think, to form their memories and imaginations. I think this helps us understand why Archbishop Cordiglione in San Francisco is seen as evil by his own Catholic teachers, parents, and students. Uh, I don't know if you know what's going on in San Francisco, but he's one of the brave bishops and archbishops who st has said Catholic teachers, those who work in Catholic schools, cannot undermine Catholic doctrine. Says, so, you know, that's a very reasonable thing. He is getting so crucified uh, in the media there. They've hired, um, I don't know who did it, but somebody hired a top gun 
media fellow who, uh, who does smear campaigns in national politics to come and go after the archbishop. He tries to explain to the world and to his own faithful that it's, what he's asking is very reasonable. He told some California legislators who wrote in protest about this, he said, well, you know what you're asking me to do? It'd be like for you as Democrats to hire Republicans to run your campaign and then have them completely undermine your campaign so that you'd lose. And then, and then you say, I'm not going to fire you and then have everybody else get mad at you. <laughs> Very reasonable. I mean, this is the minimal little bit of reason here. Um, but his flock does not see the reason at all. Much less the courage, the pastoral love, and the lively faith in his words. Uh, hundreds engaged in a protest march at the beginning of Holy Week. I guess they're, they're at it again, I think, this week. Some hundred and uh, several hundred, I think, people marched to uh, the, uh, the Episcopal Palace to register their protests. And this is a quote from a paper online. Many of the demonstrators at Monday's peaceful procession and vigil said the archbishop's proposals go against the spirit and teaching of Jesus. At the core of the religion is love, acceptance, respect, and dignity, said Gino Gresh, 18, a senior at Sacred Heart. Whatever the archbishop is doing is completely contrary to that. So, how does a high school senior in a Catholic school come to judge that his bishop's insistence on Catholic teaching is completely contrary to the core of his religion. It's against the spirit and teaching of Jesus. What does a senior in high school mean by love, acceptance, respect, and dignity? I don't know the young man in question, but I will propose that many seniors like him have no real meaning for any of those words. They will likely, they will very likely not have been given any definitions of those terms. Even if they had, the definitions would likely have bored them to death. They might have some concrete, fleshed out, powerful images drawn from contemporary television or movies or video games, maybe, right? Um, and I don't watch a lot of these things, so I can't um, bring in all of them, but you know, maybe like Harry Potter, maybe the Lego movie, maybe X-Men. Um, maybe these are the things that they connect with love, acceptance, respect, and dignity. Perhaps they have seen images of the civil rights movement and heard the stories of the heroic acts of brotherhood that won much more than just judicial recognition of dignity. But most have not. I've checked with, uh, checked with some of my people who were teaching in the high schools and they said, no, they don't know anything about that. <laughs> it's just sad. It's really sad. I wonder if they know anything about the Civil War. And today is the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War, which I was just sort of deafened by the silence about that. Can't believe that there isn't much more being made of that. Maybe they simply have pictures amounting to little more than motivational posters or cat posters, if you've seen the Lego movie. That's or they might just have feelings without much in the way of images or thoughts at all. Yet these can be powerful feelings. And they're even more powerful for being unchecked by any thought or any context, any story context or anything like that. Even more powerful are the images and feelings that go with the contrary words. Hate, rejection, disrespect, contempt. How often have our young been led to imagine institutional authority in just this way? Um, my daughters have gotten into Adam 12 lately. Um, Adam 12 is an old police show from the 70s. And I don't know exactly why. I don't know why they started watching it but they went through the entire series, seven years, and now they're going back again. Um, <laughs> and when you watch Adam 12, you know, it reminds me of how, with how much respect and sympathy police officers were, portray were portrayed back then. Um, and then I think it was probably like something like the, the 
Hill Street Blues or something, that kind, of move, that kind of television series started to change all of that. And I don't think that there, I don't know if there are, there's anything like that anymore that, that shows figures of authority in such a sympathetic light. It's not like they don't have problems, but, but uh, you can understand that they're doing a good thing and they're trying to do a good thing. Does love for our young call to mind the mysteries of the Holy Triduum we continue to celebrate. Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Jesus agonizing decision in the garden. Jesus suffering on the cross to renew our lost dignity. Jesus rising triumphantly and bringing merciful love to the apostles who had abandoned and denied them. Denied him, sorry. Does dignity call to mind the prodigal son who dissipated his inheritance and was forced to eat pig slop? Do acceptance and respect recall his father who accepted his son's very minimal repentance and still clothed him in the garments of sonship which he clearly did not deserve? Now, I don't mean anything of what I've said to suggest that Gino Gresh or anyone else involved in the protests is bad at heart. That they took the time to make a public protest shows just the opposite. And this is the tragedy. As Gandalf said, and I have to work Tolkien to every talk that I do. As Gandalf said, looking at the dead in the heart of Gondor's sacred place, work of the enemy, such deeds he loves, friend at war with friend, loyalty divided and confusion of hearts. How is Gino supposed to imagine responsible parent pastoral fatherhood in our, in our age when our passions for freedom, equality, and self-determination have undermined the very existence and meaning of family life, which is where you have your most profound experience of responsible pastoral fatherhood? My aunt was a loved and respected teacher in the Godwin Heights School Districts for 30 years. She retired 20 years ago, and even at that time she said, I am teaching the third generation of non-parented children. Considerations like these open us up to the complete task of Catholic education. If Catholic schools are to fulfill their mission as greenhouses of the new evangelization, if they are to be places where young Catholics and old teachers become fervent lovers of Jesus Christ and his church. We must assess ourselves on precisely these sorts of questions. Do we see our task as contributing to the formation of a wise and understanding people? Do we attend to the formation of the religious imagination along with the knowledge of doctrine? Do we attend to the importance of the literature they read? Do their history and social studies readings contribute to or undermine what is being taught in their religion class? Um, one, one of my, on my very first uh, program that I did, um, a week-long retreat I do for teachers um, to introduce them to this vision of education, one of the theology teachers told me a story from his school that the um, history teacher, in their history class they were reading something in the history textbook which gave the kind of usual account of uh, where did the, how did the Pope gain so much power? Well, it's because the bishops all wanted more power, and so they kind of co uh, grabbed, it to, grabbed it for themselves. And then, um, and then, of course, Rome was the biggest city, so the Pope ended up having the most push, especially at the time of um, the fall of Rome and that sort of thing. And so one of the students said to the history teacher, um, well, that's, that's very different than what we're learning in religion class. And the history teacher said, well, this is history. That's religion. And that was the end of it. What about science and math? Do we take advantage of the many opportunities these subjects offer to arouse wonder, excite about truth, and develop reason, imagination, and even love. Yes, believe it or not, we had a senior this year at Thomas Aquinas College wrote her thesis on the beauty of mathematics. Very good. 
Are we guiding our students to bring their learning to the celebration of the sacred liturgy and, and to personal prayer? Magisterial documents and education have been suggesting these questions since the time of the Council. The secular world says that education should be for the sake of college and career readiness. Over and over again, that is the, 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 the expression to show you what education is all about, what K-12 education is all about. We insist in the esoteric but powerful definition of the sacred congregation for education that a school is, and you should take this down, you will have to memorize it and there will be a test, a privileged place for integral formation by means of a systematic and critical assimilation of culture. It's one of my very favorite de definitions. If you want to know more, I can talk about that for a long time. Archbishop Michael Miller, the former secretary for the congregation, has gathered together the core of Vatican teaching in a helpful little book, The Holy See's Teachings on Catholic Schools. In it, he presents five benchmarks to guide a Catholic assessment of schools, attending to the goals, the persons, the community, the wisdom, and the witness that should mark all Catholic schools. The fourth benchmark, which he entitles imbued with a Catholic worldview throughout the curriculum, is particularly relevant to my topic. So I'm going to quote a little bit from that. Instruction should be authentically Catholic in content and methodology across the entire program of studies. Catholicism has a particular take on reality that should animate its schools. It is a comprehensive way of life to be enshrined in the school's curriculum. Catholic schools do far more than convey information to passive students. They aspire to teach wisdom, habituating their students to desire learning so much that he or she will delight in becoming a self-learner. He goes on to quote from one of the congregation's documents. From the nature of the Catholic school also stems one of the most significant elements of its educational project, the synthesis of culture and faith. The endeavor to interweave reason and faith, which has become the heart of individual subjects, makes for unity, articulation, and coordination bringing forth within what is learnt in a school a Christian vision of the world, of life, of culture, and of history. Blessed John Henry Newman in his book on the development of Christian doctrine pointed out how difficult this integration is. In order to integrate all the aspects of human life, into a coherent, beautiful, and powerful picture. You have to have an enormously powerful central idea. Now, where are we to find the culture, the wisdom, that is to play a guiding role in our formation of the young entrusted to us? Certainly in Catholic doctrine. More completely, in the compendium of doctrine and story, truth and drama, that we find in the scriptures and in the liturgy. But we have much more than this. The gospel itself was the mustard seed planted in the ground that became the tree harboring all manner of birds. Pope Benedict affirmed at the University of Regensburg what many others have said. Greco-Roman civilization was the perfect soil for the gospel. The power of the gospel purified and incorporated the fruit of centuries of humanity striving to reach its potential. Out of this came Augustine's confessions, the passionate lived experience of monastic life under the rule of St. Benedict, St. Thomas's Summa and his Eucharistic hymns, Dante's Divine Comedy, the careful justice of canon and civil law, the polyphony of pa uh, Palestrina and the harmony of Mozart, the morally, politically, psychologically amazing works of Shakespeare, the playful profundity of Chesterton, and the soul-piercing beauties of Tolkien. 
Why is this amazing heritage not front and center in every Catholic school? The answer involves many factors. I'm going to suggest one very important one I think is true. I believe that Catholic educators have lost the confidence that the Catholic world knows much more about education than the secular world. Um, I think it's fairly true that almost all of the Catholic education programs take most of what they teach from the secular universities. Um, we were just looking through some of the uh, standards um, for Catholic schools that one organization came up with, and almost everyone begins with, meet the standards of the other people. <laughs> so the, the top benchmark for Catholic schools is to meet the standards set by other schools, other organizations. Now, I think partly this lack of confidence in our own ability to do this, um, in our, our own ability to actually use the profound wisdom we have to explain and teach others about education, um, has to do with the fact that we are moderns. And I love living in the modern world. I wouldn't want to live in any other time. But it does tend to make us instinctively think that the pre-modern world has little wisdom or understanding worth paying attention to. Um, that's the word modern comes from the Latin word modus, which sometimes means now. So moderns are the now people. And if you, as you go and read the founders of modernity, people like Machiavelli and Galileo and Bacon and Descartes, um, that is, it's just indicative of what they say is that People before us have failed to learn anything worthwhile. And so we're starting anew and we're going to get it. We're, we're the ones who are going to get it right. Now I understand that because, at least in part, they were stifled by a lot of bullheaded dogmatism. But unfortunately, that led them to reject tradition as the beginning of learning. That re led them to reject the received culture as a treasury that we use, that we must know if we're going to be wise. The past doesn't have all the answers, but it gets us a long way there so that we can then, in light of modern developments, we can, we can develop that wisdom. But the moderns reject tradition, they reject its idealism, they reject its intellectualism, its accomplishments, they even reject its basis in ordinary language. So they pick apart, they pick apart the idea that you would, you, that you're, the way that we speak from the way that we were taught, just picked up naturally as children, um, that that can do anything but confuse us, which is why they moved away from language to symbolism. So it's why they thought it was crucial finally to just use symbols even in something as very material as chemistry. Descartes, in a uh, really enjoyable little book called the, um, the Discourses, there's a longer title, I can't remember it right now. Um, <laughs> but Descartes, in the beginning of it, he, he reviewed his very fine Jesuit classical education, went through it point by point, and then went back through it point by point and, told, and showed why all of it was useless for him as a person who wanted to gain real knowledge. And so he had to just reject it all and do it all on his own. The moderns even reoriented the goal of learning, which they thought should be less about attaining wisdom regarding eternal truths, which they either thought were a snap or they thought were impossible, completely impossible for the human mind to achieve. Instead, learning should be ordered to solving real world problems and to extending our control over nature and over man. They were extraordinarily successful. The power that we today enjoy over nature is a testament to the foundation they laid in mathematics and the sciences. But so is the doubt about the relevance and possibility of wisdom. So we have lost the wisdom to know how to turn all the power that they've given us to the service of authentic human flourishing. How to regain this wisdom for ourselves and our children 
The wisdom our time so desperately needs is the great question that Catholic educators must take up. Many schools such as Sacred Heart have recognized the problem and taken the lead in centering their curriculum and their communities around the treasuries of Christian wisdom. These schools have succeeded largely because of parents who wanted the very best education for their children. I'm continually amazed at, it's really an American thing. That's why I, one of the reasons I love being an American is American parents say, my children aren't getting any education or they're, they're, bad things are happening in the schools. Well, I guess I better do it. <laughs> I better take it up. I better found a school. I better put on a high school musical and raise some funds or whatever you do to, to, to get it started. Um, and that, that's been the seed of this entire movement. These parents have shown what it means for parents to be the primary educators of their children. And to understand that, which is often, often used, but I don't know how much people think about what it means, um, but I think it's a lot like the parallel truth that parents are the primary health care givers for their children. If you think about health care, parents oversee their children's daily regimen of food, work, and exercise. Parents provide first aid. Parents notice changes that might indicate developing health problems. They decide when children need to see the doctors, and they decide what doctors they will see, at least we do now. Um, I guess less and less. But the ju they judge whether the doctors are providing the best care. And they are the ones who determine whether their children are actually going to follow the doctor's orders or not. Nothing can replace the role of parents in health care. Similarly, nothing can replace the role of parents in education. Parents need to judge what is best for their children's education. That doesn't mean they have to do it all themselves, but they have to make the decision about, about the effect that the education they choose for their children is actually having on their children. They need to support their schools by working with their children at home. To do this well, they need to educate themselves about education. But even more than that, they need to realize that they are the most influential teachers their children have. Christopher Dawson explains that education in its widest sense is the process by which culture is handed down by society and acquired by the individual. And he points out that something like learning to speak, that's the most important thing that ever happens in education. It's the foundation for everything else. And then culture, he explains, is the whole pattern of human life and thought in a living society. Every living society, from the, largest to the, from the smallest to the largest, embodies a culture. Children, the most attentive and imitative of all creatures on earth, absorb culture, especially in the most intensely experienced community, the family. As teachers, Parents must themselves be learners. The most difficult thing in my work with teachers, the most difficult thing for many teachers, is facing the idea that they have much to learn. But properly understood, this should be one of the most attractive aspects of teaching. Teaching is wonderful because it demands that you learn. If you're going to be an effective teacher, you have to be learning all the time. A physical therapist I knew, he helped me with my back, thankfully, um, he, he said that teaching was for him, he uh, taught in a PhD, uh, in a physical therapy program, was the most difficult, the most challenging, and most exciting thing he had ever done. He had to face the many, many questions his students would shoot at him. He frequently had to say, I don't know, and then work at go back home and work hard to try to find the answers so you'd have them for the next class. Um, and he said that was what happened for the first three years of teaching. And then he said, like a spigot, all the questions stopped. And they only had one question after that. Can you guess what the one question they had was? 
Will it be on the test? That was the only question they had. Dramatic change from about the early, year, early 2000s. Um, so, so as parents, you should look on your children's education as a great time of learning for yourself. Read to your children from their earliest ages. Uh, it's, I think it's amazing how, how much children can comprehend in terms of vocabulary and even complicated sentence structure if you read it to them. They can't do it themselves when they have to read, but they can, they can absorb the most complicated stories, uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing to see what they can do. Read to them from their earliest ages. Pick books that form the imagination in the way that you think it ought to be formed. Yesterday I was talking with some Hillsdale graduate students who were reminiscing about the powerful effect a beautifully illustrated children's version of St. George and the Dragon by Trina Shart Hyman, which I recommend, had on their imagination. You know, they must have encountered this when they were like five or six years old. And the, all three, they're all guys too. They all remember these wonderful illustrations of that story. Um, you can draw on some of John Sr.'s Thousand Good Books list, which floats around the internet. Watch excellent movies and television series with them. When my children come of age, 17, 18, something like that, uh, we watch the 1980s miniseries of Brides Hitter Visited with Jeremy Irons and Anthony Andrews, one of the most beautiful, powerful television productions ever. Not something you can watch with the younger children. But it's, a, it's not just a beautiful, powerful, imaginative experience, but it's a tremendous opportunity to talk about the world that they're going to be going into, um, the world that is the, with a lot of sinful people, and yet a lot of people who even in their sin are really beautiful. And how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that? Don't just passively watch, discuss what is good and bad about them. Ask them questions and encourage them to ask you questions in turn. Look up answers that you don't know. And a lot of times when we're watching, we have our computers with us so that we can look up stuff real quick you know, <laughs> um, that comes up. Above all, don't undersell your children. Children are natural, hungry absorbers of learning. They are versatile and capable. Um, one, of the, one of the problems that classical education encounters is people, learning by heart is the foundational thing, uh, activity for the younger children. And when teachers hear that that's what they're supposed to be doing, they'll, they'll revolt because they never did it themselves until maybe they got to high school and college and then when learning by heart when memorizing is a real pain and it's really slavish. But if you do it for younger children, for them it's just a natural, delightful, wonderful learning experience. Uh, I started reading The Hobbit to my son when he was four years old. He really enjoyed it. I was like, uh, Tolkien is at the center of my heart here. And so that was wonderful for me. And I said, he wanted more. So I said, okay, I'll try to, I'll maybe start with the Lord of the Rings. I'm sure that he's going to not follow this for very long. He followed it the entire way through until he actually did get tired, like after they finally defeated Sauron and some other denouement, and he finally did give up. But that entire time, and I was asking him all the time, do you really, I could ask him questions to see if he really understood what was going on. And he was amazingly perceptive of that, at that. Um, I remember a family my wife and I knew before we were married. Mozart's Don Giovanni was their favorite, uh, favorite thing to watch. I took my kids to a college performance of Shakespeare when they were fairly young. And I thought, well, I'll be happy if I can last through the first act before they say, I'm bored, let's go home. And I gave up. They were mesmerized by it. They, 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 ne they, they were just on the edge of their seats the whole time. Actually, it was on the floor. They were sitting on the floor. Which... Um, my kids' school, St. Augustine Academy in Ventura, instituted mandatory choir for the entire K-12 student body a few years ago. This year, the high school is putting together a performance of Gilbert and Sullivan's HMS Pinafore. They have benefited from a number of Hollywood professionals who have volunteered their time because they heard there's a high school that's actually doing Gilbert and Sullivan. And so they were completely delighted with it and wanted to come and see what was happening and then ended up helping them out in different ways. 
Just last week, I heard from a teacher at St. Agatha Academy in Lexington, Kentucky. Their parish school took up a classical curriculum a year ago, a year and a half ago, just like uh, Sacred Heart. Susan, atten Susan Wallace attended our retreat last year, during which we discussed Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. So when her class of 25 second graders, um, and she tells me this is, a, this is a fairly rural town, so she's got all kinds of families that are involved in the school. She decided, well, why don't I try reading some of Mark Antony's funeral oration to them? And they just ate it up. They thought that was wonderful. And then they watched some performances on YouTube. That were, they were really excited about that. So she said, okay. And then they've been doing poetic memorization um, as part of their daily, uh, daily activities. So she said, well, this is really hard. But uh, she gave them the first 35 lines of Mark Antony's funeral oration. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. So that's how it starts. I'm sure you all remember it. Um, so anyway, 35 lines before he pauses to wipe his tears away. So she gave him the 35 lines. And she said, you know, um, this is really hard. Uh, if you can do a little bit of this, you can get some extra credit. She didn't expect anybody would do it. About a week later, one little girl came back and said, I got it. And she recited the whole thing. And then the next day, another one did it. And then two more. And within about a week's time, I think, all 25 children could recite the 35 lines of Mark Antony's speech. One of the kids said, oh, my dad said it's really important to get the pauses right. So then they, then they spent time trying to, trying to figure out exactly where to pause in their, in their speech. If you look at our... Uh, if you look at our website, um, at the blog, um, I have this story there. And then the, one of the parents posted on Facebook, um, I guess they were going to a birthday party. And two of the kids in the, cla in the class were there. And they're just rattling this stuff off <laughs> in the back seat just for fun. So that video is up there. Now, people started to hear about this. Um, the daughter of the principal, a senior in high school, was babysitting for one of the kids. She had a copy of Julius Caesar, which she was reading for, for her own class. The kid said, oh, yeah, Julius Caesar, I know about that from school. And she said, oh, yeah, what do you know? And she said, And so the, the girl went back, went back to her dad and she said, do you know what's going on with your second graders? And then she got, uh, she got Susan to bring some of the kids to the senior group to recite for them, and they were all blown away by it. I could tell many more stories from the schools I've gotten to know around the country. Every time I visit one, I come away thanking God for the blessings our Christian tradition is providing for these children. But I'm also heartbroken at what most students have to endure. We must then become a people who remember the stories that give context to our statutes, that help us to become aware of the good and evil, the beauty and the ugliness that we find in our lives. This will allow us to become a wise, the wise and understanding people that Moses promised. Perhaps then we will really be the people foreshadowed by Israel. Balaam the prophet, in one of the strange stories lurking in the middle of Numbers, was paid by a foreign king to curse Israel. It's a very comical story where the guy's going to fight Israel, so he hires the prophet to curse Israel. And he brings him up and... He doesn't want him to see Israel. So he tries to keep him from seeing Israel. But the guy, the guy, um, the guy said, I just can do what the Lord tells me. And so he didn't. Um, he couldn't curse them. On the third time up, though, he actually showed him Israel. And so he was up on a mountain looking out over Israel. And the Lord inspired him. And it says, And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and saw Israel encamping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down but having his eyes uncovered. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel. Thank you.
So why is intellect seen as undesirable today? Um, can you tell me why you're think why you're wondering okay, about that? Okay, because um, sometimes I see people out there when they perform these works of Shakespeare, some people get, um, I guess, intimidated, and there's almost a, a rejection of people who try to gain intellect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the reasons do you think that the secular world shies away from uh, the higher arts or the culture? Um, yeah, I think mm, to give a short answer to a really, really hard question, um, that to, when Plato, I'll give a little longer answer because I can use an image. Um, Plato in the cave allegory, he has, he talks about the way in which we are by nature and by culture, very importantly by culture, chained to look at shadows on a wall in a cave. And then when you're freed from that, you then go through a very painful process of having to try to look at light, at things where there's light. Um, and it's the, the, that whole thing is just a marvelous, um, a marvelous little story about the, the interior struggles for, that people find who actually try to learn something. And at any rate, he gets all the way out and he looks at lots of different things up there. The last thing he looks at is the sun. He wants to look at the sun itself. The sun is the image of the good. And he says, the good is what gives being and intelligibility to everything else. I think that's deeply, deeply true. So if you're going to have understanding, you're going to have to start with a vision of what is the good that makes sense of everything else. That, if you actually say, I know the good, I know what is good for people, um, you then squelch our horrible, contemptuous uh, understanding of freedom. So people panic. So that if you promote the development of the intellect and the pursuit of wisdom and culture, then you're, you're not going to be able to be a relativist finally. And I think that, that because, of the, because of that lived reality, that's why modernity ended up undermining beauty. Uh, the be beauty is the, is the way in which we experience the intellectual aspect of the good. That's kind of complicated. But, the, um, but I think it's very true, and that's why from uh, the ninth maybe late 19th century on, um, art became more and more ugly. And not just, not just ugly, but devoted to ugliness. Principles of the ugly. Um, <laughs> uh, the um, atonal music, you ever heard it, you know, it's, you'd never want to hear it again. <laughs> Though, you know, there's something to it. There's something to everything that people care passionately about. But the atonal music, basically the principle is destroy, make your composition such that you destroy any sense of hierarchy among the, thing, in the things you're hearing. So there can be no, there can be no, you can, you can have things repeat, but you can't pick up any patterns. It's, it's intentionally done that way, at least the 12-tone scales were the way I understand them. So intellect to flourish means a vision of the good, which then becomes a judge about how we're using our freedom, and we hate that. So that's my short version. Yes. One sec. Uh, Got a microphone coming here. This is, for, this is for posterity, so be clever. <laughs> Question number one, um, concrete ways to develop the imagination in the children, and also, um, having a large homeschool family that just tries to get something accomplished before time flies. Um, what are some ways to encourage a love of learning? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's another huge question. I'll give a few ideas I have. 
Um, I think that the, um, I think having beautiful things around them is really crucial. And beautiful and rich things. I mean, there's, there's um, let's see, a, a principle that I've had in raising my own kids is that if, if there's a cartoon or something, if I as an adult don't like it, my kids aren't watching it. Because if I can't enjoy it, it means there's no depth to it. Whatever it is that they're enjoying is not anything that's going to last for them as an adult. So um, I remember Andrew Kern, who's the founder of the Searcy Institute, uh, talked about, one of the first times I heard him talk, he said, um, he said, why do like eight, nine, and ten-year-old boys love hard, nasty rock music? Well, it's because they were exposed to Barney. And because they were listening to that, and they were, you know, the, probably when they're four, it's like, oh, this is, you know, whatever, you play along with it. And then around seven or eight, they start to realize how insipid the whole thing is. And so they just revolt totally and go to the opposite. So they not only have beautiful things, but beautiful, rich things. Um, I was talking to Sean and Zach as we were touring the Sacred Heart Building, the importance in the classroom of having rich painting so that when you're, when your student's attention wanders, which it is going to wander, no matter how good a teacher you are, then it's going to wander to something like that. And over the course of the year, they're going to keep looking back at that. And, you know, they'll probably never get bored with it. They'll, they'll always like, oh, well, I never noticed that. I never noticed that. That's why um, you can read some of this great literature over and over and over again, because there's always things you didn't notice. That, that are in there. You enjoyed it the first time, but there are things you didn't notice. This is also why I think that classical education is an excellent way to uh, address the problem of diverse learning styles. Classical education tries to immerse students in the beautiful and the imaginatively rich in all kinds of ways. And so it's got something for the, the verbal learners and the, the oral learners, the, ones, uh, the, the image learners. It's got something for everybody. Um, so that's it, and that's the number one. And the beautiful is a wonderful thing. It's found in everything you do and everything you read. So it's not just beautiful artworks, beautiful music, um, beautiful stories. Uh, that's, you know, your library. The, 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 what the library you have available, the kids are going to start, you know, messing around with on their own. You can have all kinds of things in there that you don't even have to tell them to read. That's the, but you want what, what they find yeah, uh, what they're going to find, you want to know what's in there and approve of it in that way. Um, yeah, yeah, the beautiful, your life is beautiful. The way you live an ordered, an ordered life amidst chaos, um, or a chaotic life with order holding it together, um, that's beautiful, I think. And so that's, that's forming their imagination. The people cannot, honestly, we go to, we go to, Little League games um, with our six kids. And all the, all the time people come and say, how can you possibly do that? They cannot, they honestly cannot imagine how it's possible for anybody to raise six children. So your life that you're doing with your children right now is, is uh, communicating a lot of beauty that then is allowing them to imagine what family life can be and then that will guide them um, Later on, was there another? There was another part to your question. Um, that one's a harder one for me because I always did love learning, and when somebody always does, then it's like, what? You don't? I don't know. I don't know. You know, Michael Jordan could never be a basketball coach because he could never figure out the struggles that people were having. I think, um, but uh, one of the things my aunt was very, very important for me. Um, inspiring my love of learning uh, because she would talk to me. Um, she would listen to me. Uh, she, <laughs> she always would tell me when, later in adult life, oh yeah, I remember when we were walking along and you saw a gra uh, praying mantis and you said, well, how high can a praying mantis climb anyway? And she says, I don't know, I guess I'll ask him sometime. But, <laughs> um, but that, she, that I felt comfortable enough with her to ask her that kind of question was a testament to the relationship that she, um, that she established with me. In fact, if you love learning, 
then your children will have, you know, will be three or four steps along to loving learning. If you, if you, if you read things uh, that aren't just how-to books, and I know as a mother you need a lot of how-to books, but if you can manage to squeeze in time, you know, and as the kids get a little older, maybe a little bit more time, but um, squeeze in time to read things on your own and then tell your kids about it because you were excited about this or you were deeply moved by something, that will witness to them uh, that's a powerful witness that I think um, can help. I think that, I'm not sure, I, I, do, I do believe in research, at a, you know, has, has its uh, place in confirming our antidotal, anti, an, uh, anecdotal stories, but, um, and there hasn't been enough research, there hasn't been any much research done on these things yet. Um, but uh, I guess I really believe that children, most children naturally love to learn. Um, and so the problem isn't so much how to inspire them, though you do want to do that for them some. It's what's getting in their way. <laughs> what's, what's squelching them? Telling children, um, telling children, stop bothering me with questions. Telling children, oh, you're wrong all the time. You know, whenever they, whenever they propose some idea to just say, oh, no, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. That's not right. That, I think, would be really discouraging to children. One more. Uh, I have a question as uh, we're transitioning into the classical education, and as is a lot of the country and this movement starts to mm -hmm. really gain steam, do you have any practical advice for not only the parents, but maybe also for the school systems that are doing this? Because my kids went from a homeschooling environment into a classical education model, and they just like jumped onto the moving sidewalk. I mean, it was really difficult, and continues to be a lot of struggles for us to be able to take what we've done at this point, mm -hmm. because we haven't raised them from the beginning in a classical mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. it's a, we're late to the program, if you will. Yeah. And as more and more people do this, is there any practical advice or anything that you can say that would be helpful to? Yeah. So how, how old are your children? How old are they, honey? <laughs> <laughs> 13, 12, and 10, and we have 13, some older ones that have already gone through the, uh, yeah. and have graduated and moved on. But we have three of them here in the school, and it's been a difficult transition to come from a homeschooling environment to, like I said, it's been a very quick and a, and a ramped up, like, and, and I don't know if you've had any other problems with other schools that have that as they put in a uh, classical curriculum and how you take a group that have, uh, has not been exposed to this and now they're immersed in this. It's a, it's a pretty tricky yeah. transition. I just um, wonder if you, what challenges have you faced? Well, let's see. Um, I don't do it myself, so <laughs> I, have to, I have to learn vicariously from the teachers who are doing it and some of them are here, might be able to offer better answers than I could on that particular question. I think that as a teacher, you need to be aware of where your students are and what, what impact what you're doing is having on them. And so um, you, I, I guess one thing is I would, certainly make the teacher aware that the students are, feel like they're really struggling. Um, one thing that has happened, I think, um, as many people have, many schools have tried to do Catholic education, many parents have, I mean classical education, and many parents have done it uh, on their own. There have been a lot of mistakes made. And the reason is that classical education died. Um, it was a living tradition through, you know, from the ancient Greek and even Hebrew times all the way up until the early 20th century. Um, in some form or another, classical education was the way that people educated. And so the, there's a living tradition. And when there's a living tradition, there's a lot of experience to draw on. And young teachers and people new to it um, have a lot of safety nets and things. Um, but then it died. And we're recovering it from books and from our ideas of what things might be like. But without the lived experience that you know, gives us a much more filled out experience and imagination of it. 
So a lot of teachers will make mistakes, and one of the big mistakes that they make is, I think, to try to do too much. The teachers um, get really enthusiastic about it and then overwhelm their students. And, you know, it usually calms down after a few years. And I don't know if that's what's happening with your kids, but at least I would make sure the teachers are aware of that. Um, I think, too, if there are particular areas of it, um, as parents, uh, I would try to start reading some of the things they're doing. So if they're doing Beowulf, um, one of the schools I worked with in Sterling, Colorado, I'm always trying to be aware of, like, is this a school that's formed by a lot of the kids from a lot of college professors or something? That's going to give you one, like, okay, it works for them, but does it work for other people? Um, I went to a school in Sterling, Colorado, two hours in the middle of nowhere, Colorado, on the Eastern Plains. And, you know, smaller, small town, drawing from people around there. And they had a teacher who um, came in sixth, seventh, eighth grade and started doing Beowulf with the kids. They struggled, I think, the first, first semester, but he kept at it and he had the right sense of, when am I pushing them and when am I killing them? But by the second semester, they were really loving the, the Beowulf and loving the other things that he was doing. And they had gained, through that, the ability to do lots more things. Um, so if it's something like that, then hopefully, as a parent, you'd be able to say, okay, let me, tell, let me take some of this Beowulf up with you. Let me try to read some of it with you. Um, let me see if, what are your problems with this? You know, do, uh, what are my problems with it when I read it? Um, it um, trying to take it as an opportunity for collaborative learning with your child, I think, is something you can really do to, to help it along. So those would be two things. Make sure the teacher is aware of it and maybe um, they can pay more attention or maybe throttle back a little bit. But also engage in it your, yourself with them um, and then you'll have their questions and you'll, they won't be alone in trying to do it. How does that sound? Okay. All right, thank you very much.